O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works. Forty years long I was grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
So this week we're going to continue our reading through Genesis in chapter 29. Last week, if you remember, we heard the account of Jacob marrying his wives Leah and Rachel. And now this week we're going to begin to see the birth of Jacob's sons through Leah. So hear the word of the Lord, beginning in verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived and bore a son, and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. This is a, a point where you're kind of forced to stop and go, Wait a minute, this, this marriage that wasn't even supposed to happen. And yet look at the names of the sons that have been born to Jacob. You have Reuben, Levi, Simeon, and lastly, Judah. And Judah is significant, obviously, because Christ is from the lineage of Judah. And it's quite remarkable to think about the fact that, you know, again, from a marriage that wasn't even supposed to take place, now we have the lineage of our Lord. And I was thinking about that, and it took me to Revelation just thinking about what a great thing this is when you see the scene in heaven and there's a seal, there's a scroll with seals on it and there's weeping and it says, who's worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is the Lord that we worship, the one who's worthy to open the scrolls. And so it's, it's a great thing, and it deserves great praise when we see Judah being born to Leah, knowing that our Lord is going to be in the lineage of Judah, and he's our Savior. And so we give him praise. Amen. As I lead us in corporate prayer, I couldn't help but uh, with everything that has gone on over the last week and the suffering of loss of life across the globe as well as within our own congregation. I was drawn this morning to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And I'd like to read Malachi 4.2 to you. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. A wonderful image of those who have hope and faith in our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And we are comforted by those words. And may we be comforted by the words of the Lord himself, where he said, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let us go before the Lord in that comfort and pray.
Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We shall not fear, even though we do fear, we admit we do. But Lord, we, you have told us to be still and know that you are God. And Lord, may we now be still and know that you are God. There is none like you. None like you. Father, those who hope in the Lord shall rejoice, shall be made new. And Father, we think and we pray for those within our own congregation that are mourning, that are suffering, that it seems like the joy has been sapped from our hearts. But that is not so. Father, may you restore that joy. But in our mourning and in our suffering, we pray for those that are sapped. We think of the Howard family. And we pray for Jim and Kay and the rest of their family. We pray for your peace and your comfort that surpasses all understanding that this peace comes from above and it dwells within our very soul. Father, we admit that we struggle with that pain and suffering. and We will struggle. So, Father, we do lift them up to you, that they would be blessed in their time of suffering. Father, I also pray, we also pray for our brother Tom Real and his family. We pray for that very same comfort and joy in those moments that will happen. But we don't mourn without hope. And I pray, Father, that they would be comforted by you, by the very power and presence of your Spirit in their life. That they would draw near to one another But always remember the power and presence of our Almighty God. And we rejoice as well those that will leap from the stalls. We thank you, Father, that have that blessed hope. 
Father, I, we also lift up those many that have been afflicted across the world, across this expanse of what you have created. And that many, the ones that know you and the ones that don't know you, that they would draw near and that Lord, you tell us those who draw near, you stand at the door and knock. Lord, may they be fed and may they be saved by salvation in you and you alone. So even in the midst of this pandemic, that you... <laughs> It's the craziness of life that we can still glorify you as we do not fear. We need to live within this fear of the pandemic. And we need to live a life that is obedient and worthy to you. So Father, I pray for that courage and I pray for that love and mercy and goodness and kindness and gentleness, self-control, that we would pour that out, whether it be in person six feet away or not, or whether it be on the phone and FaceTime and Zoom or whatever it is. We need to live. And I thank you, Father, for the life that you have given each and every one of us. We pray for our country. We pray for our globe, the world. And we pray that you would sustain us. That we would turn to you for our source of strength and hope. And that you would encourage us and you will encourage us. And you will never leave us or forsake us. What a blessed assurance and faithful God we have. May you anoint our pastor with words from above. And may they pierce our very heart and soul today. And may we continue to live for you as we go forth in love because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And we'll thank you in his mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning. We're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, just to review in a very quick way, you remember that we saw it, we started with the Beatitudes and we saw how Jesus spoke about the attitudes of the heart that are to characterize the life of the Christian. And from there, he moved on from the attitudes of the heart, the inward things, to what is the influence that the church is supposed to have in the world? Do you remember in it, he said these two things, you are to be the salt of the earth, which, spo which speaks to our role as a preservative in the world to keep things going. And also you are the light of the world. We, are, we exist in order to shine forth the love of Christ to a world. Into the darkness we are to shine. And by the way, with what light? Are we to look within and find the light within? It's, no, it's not Eastern mysticism, but rather as we image God, as we conform ourselves to his glory, we reflect the love of Christ to a world that needs to hear it. 
Then, last week, we, we had a kind of transition where Jesus clarifies a couple of things, that people might have had some misunderstandings about things. You remember he's always having these run-ins with the Pharisees, and he's getting into arguments about the Sabbath. And maybe people misunderstand it when Jesus says something like this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it could reasonably be understood from this that Jesus is saying, hey, all of these things, all of these burdens that the Pharisees are putting upon you, I've come to lift this all away from you and I'm getting rid of the law. But actually, as we find out, it's the opposite of that, right? We read last week, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, unless heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven." So what do we see here? What we see is that rather than, let's say, Sabbath, rather than getting rid of Sabbath, rather than saying Sabbath doesn't matter, don't worry about it, Jesus is saying no, to the contrary, Sabbath matters even more. But what I'm doing is teaching you the true meaning of the Sabbath. In other words, whereas the Pharisees were so concerned to scrupulously, you know, do all these workarounds to show how they're actually keeping the Sabbath by resting, Jesus is saying, no, the real point of Sabbath is to bring rest to others. That's the spirit of the thing. It's not about getting rid of Sabbath, but it's about doing the Sabbath rightly. Then he goes on and he said something really amazing. For I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that was really surprising. Why? Because the Pharisees were considered the most righteous, the most holy. They set themselves up as the guys. I just kind of like to think about it. They're the bouncers in front of the kingdom of God. They're standing there and they're blocking access to people. We know we have a right to the kingdom of God, but it's you people we're not sure of. You're not worthy of the kingdom. And Jesus comes along and gets mad at them for this. Who do you think you are to set yourselves up and to say others aren't worthy when even yourselves aren't worthy? Who is worthy of the kingdom of God? None, no one, no, not one. Do you remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? Of everyone born of woman, there's never been anyone greater than John the Baptist, he said. But what? He follows it with something interesting. Do you remember? He said, but even he is least than anyone in the kingdom of heaven. That's amazing. In other words, no one is righteous. No, not one. I guess this is the heart of the gospel, right? It gets this picture of a God who is holy what, and, and of us who are not holy. So often we have this, uh, I guess I'll call it the common sense view of religion, where we kind of are going through life and we feel like we need a, a fix. We're, we're going through life and we feel like we want to be getting an A or at least an A minus, but we're kind of getting a B minus in life. And what we really need is God's help to get us over that edge. And so Jesus comes along and gives his life for us. It's this whole Christian story. And now it brings me up from like an 83 to a 93 and that'll do it. And I'm in. And that's not the gospel right? What is the gospel? The gospel is the message of an unutterably holy God, a God who is light and in him is no darkness at all. And we were created to bear his image in this creation. We were created to have dominion in his creation. We were his image bearers, his people. And with our sin against him, we have breached our communion with God. We who were designed for communion with God find ourselves in a position where we can't even have communion with God. We can't see God and live. And so the gospel is this message of how Jesus comes into the world and stands in our place and by, by his taking upon himself the penalty that was ours to bear for our sin, we now have access and communion with the Father. That's the good news of the gospel. And so what I want to talk about for the rest of today is now what? Okay, now what? We understand that Jesus came and stood in our place. He died for our sins. Now what? What am I supposed to do? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Right? That's what Paul asks. I mean, if Jesus died for my sins, then I don't have to worry about it. What does Paul say to that? Do you remember? Certainly not. 
But what, why have we been saved? Well, to look into this, I wanted to go back to Exodus 19. And here's what God said about the ancient people of Israel. He said, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among, among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I want to say that again, because it's cool. What did God say about ancient Israel? What were they supposed to be? You're to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's not just a couple of priests over here. The whole kingdom, Israel, I'm setting you apart from the world that you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, you say that just applies to Israel in the old days. No. Here's what Peter says in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 11. But you, Christian, you, church, are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So now I'm going to ask that question again. Christian, what are you? There's a couple of people out here because this is being videotaped. What are you? A royal priesthood. A kingdom of priests. Right? This is very exciting. That's what you are. You are holy to God. And what does that mean when you say you're holy to God? It means God is saying to us, be holy. Christians, do not separate, do not de-link this connection between love and holiness. This has kind of been our theme for the last three weeks. It has to be said again. How often in the history of the church, especially today, how often do we like to separate these two ideas as if you can have love without holiness? As if people say, oh, I look at the message of Jesus and I really like that, but don't give me all that holiness stuff. And in doing this, we, th we assume that we are more loving than God. And it's actually a terrible sin. The opposite is a terrible sin as well. It's kind of like when we're all about holiness and not about love, when we think we're more holy than God and feel like we have to add to his rules, right? That's what the Pharisees were doing. And Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do either of them. And now, today, we get to our passage where Jesus gives us a sense, the beginning of the sense of what it means to live as a Christian. How are we to be holy? All right. And here is our verses for today. It's Matthew 21, 5, 21 and 22. Jesus says, you've heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. This is great. <laughs> this passage is awesome. And I promise you next week, we're going to talk about what you're probably thinking right now. This passage is all about like what makes this passage interesting is what's he talking about with anger? What was that about Raqqa? Next week, we're going to talk about anger today. We're going to talk about even the foundation of what he's getting at here. I was interested in this. Listen to it. Jesus begins by saying, you have heard it said. Okay. Remember that you've heard it said, to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Now, wait a minute. When did you hear that said? You know this. You heard it in the Ten Commandments. What does he say then? But I say, you've heard it said long ago in the Ten Commandments, but I say this. I just want you to see the awesome authority with which he is speaking. Do you remember after the end of Jesus, whenever Jesus would speak at the end of it, people would be amazed at what? That he spoke as one with authority. And this would sort of infuriate the rabbis. It's like this guy didn't go to Westminster Theological Seminary or RTS. Who is this guy? He comes from Nazareth. What good can come from Nazareth, right? What good indeed, right? God came into the world and dwelt in our midst and he spoke with this authority, right? Now, this is interesting. You've heard it said, but I say, Jesus is not in any way ever contradicting the righteous, rightful, eternally good law of God. In fact, what he's doing is showing us the deep meaning that had always been there. And I want to talk about this because it's one of my favorite things, the way he does this. 
Uh, do you remember in John 13, Jesus gives us the new commandment? Does anyone remember what the new commandment that's given to Christians is? Yes, I see it out there. To love one another. That's the new commandment. I mean it. I saw it out there. There's only a few. But the new commandment is, I'm going to read it to you. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. All right. That's the new commandment. Then he confuses things a bit, in my view, in 1 John 3, he says, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning. What's that? That we should love one another. Wait a minute, is it the beginning or the, or the new? And in a funny way, you can see it's like it's the oldest and the new. It comes here, 2 John, and now I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but as one you've heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Okay. This is cool. In other words, this new commandment that Jesus is teaching is just basically a revelation of what was there in the beginning, the very oldest commandment, the sum of all commandments, the fruit of all commandments. What's it about? Love one another. Love God and love one another. And when you talk like this, the oldest and the new, I'm always reminded in John 8 when Jesus says this, before Abraham was born, I am, right? Here is the oldest and the newest of the commandments. But it's an interesting question, right? So it, we all like this. It's like, oh yeah, just love one another. I would say that probably 60, I'm making that number up completely. I'll go for it. I'll say 75% of the people that hear this just will think, love one another. What does that mean? Oh, you know, be nice to one another. <laughs> yeah, but it's more than that. Jesus actually says here one of the most amazing lines in scripture. What does it mean to love one another? I'm going to read it again because it's 1 John 1, 6. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. I can't get over this. What is love? That we do the law. It's like we talked about last time in Romans 16. What is love? It's the fulfillment of the law. When we fulfill the law, we're loving our neighbor. Why? Because the law does no wrong to its neighbor. This is deep stuff. There is this connection. Not only do we cannot separate the law and love. If we do, it's not really love. Maybe it's a whole bunch of fine sentimentality, but it'll evaporate like the mist as soon as it, it gets serious. What do we mean by the law? What do we mean by that? And I just, well, let's look a little deeper into this, right? Because, uh, you know, it says, for example, do not murder, right? He was just saying this. You've heard it said, do not murder. And you're thinking, well, I've, I've obeyed the law because I haven't murdered today, right? And that's, that's true. I mean, in that sense, that's good enough for the civil standard. You haven't murdered today, so you're not going to go to court. And we can't be prosecuted for crimes that are actually what is in our own hearts. Actually, not yet, anyway. And when we get to a point in our society where we are putting people in jail for crimes that they're thinking about, it probably won't be for god godliness, right? That's a bad thought. But that said... The civil law is the standard of do not murder. But there's a deeper law, a higher authority, if you will, a higher principle in the moral law. And I wanted to talk about that. So when we read through scripture, it can be confusing sometimes. People say, well, the law, what is the law? You've heard this before, probably this word Torah, which in, in Hebrew means law or instruction. And it's sometimes attributed to the first five books of the Bible. What are they? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All five of those books are, are compiled as the law. But more specifically for what we're talking about, I'm not talking about those books, the Torah. I'm talking about the Torah, the law in scripture, which is like, if you think about it, the sum total of all the obligations that God asks of Israel in the Old Testament, most of which are found there in the first five books. And when we look at this and study it, you see there's three types of law, all right? There's the civil law, which is rules for how we get along or how the Israelites would get along with each other in the context of the ancient nation and state of Israel. And those laws have expired with that state. Then there are also, you see, there are ceremonial laws, laws that speak to how the ancient Israelites were to express their relationship with God. I'm going to give you an example of ceremonial law, like some of those ideas of, of food limitations. You know, you couldn't eat shellfish right in the Old Testament. If you read Leviticus, Deuteronomy, no shellfish. It, you can't eat lobster. 
And it's not because there's anything inherently unethical or evil about eating lobster. Why can I say that? Because in the New Testament, we're allowed to eat lobster. It's not an ethical issue. It was a ceremonial issue. The purpose of the law was to separate us from the nations. That purpose is now gone in Christ as our whole idea is to go forth to the nations. Make sense? But then there's another type of law which is ethical, right and wrong, and right and wrong is forever. And that's what explains this. So, for example, when it comes to eating lobster, it's not unethical in itself. It's, it would just be a sin in ancient Israel if you did it because God told you not to. But let's say with sexual immorality, sexual relations outside the bounds of marriage. Well, that is sinful. And it's not just sinful in ancient Israel. It's sinful always, right? Because, because that's the nature of moral law. When you look in scripture, you can see that there are certain sins that actually anger God. It brings on, it calls forth the wrath of God, the outpouring of his anger on the nations, on the peoples, on the people that practice these things. And just to review this, I want to talk about it. There's sort of four categories you could look. There are the sins that breach our communion with God, which can go under one big heading, idolatry. God hates idolatry. Do not do it because this is what breaches communion with God. And out of idolatry flows all this other poison. What's the other one? Sexual immorality. This poison that pollutes the land, breaches communion in households, destroys families. What's another one? Injustice, bloodshed, violence, the kind of stuff that breaches communion among humans, among households. What's another one? Degradation of God's created order. What's another one? When we lie, when we abuse justice and deform justice. These are the things that God hates. And when he sees it, it brings down his wrath. These are not things that change from the old to the new. They are forever the same. And brothers and sisters, we're bound by that law. Now, where is that law? It's, it says in the Westminster Confession, it's summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. In other words, when you read the Ten Commandments, the commandments that's where it is. All right. So getting to this, looking at the Ten Commandments, it's kind of interesting. Unlike civil laws, let's take this. If you think about the command, do not murder, there's a civil dimension of that law, right? As a civil said, it says, uh, do not murder. And you have not broken the law if you don't murder. That makes sense. But moral law also entails its opposite obligation. All right. That's an interesting feature of moral law, where it's like, it's not only do not murder, but what? What would be the opposite of not murdering? Think about that for a second. What it is, is to affirm and enhance the life of others. That's a very interesting thing. Here's a mark of the moral law. And moreover, we're to do it with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, I want you, what true obedience looks like is whole and wholehearted obedience. It is that affirmation and enhancement of other people's lives. And it's interesting when you think about this, it's like, well, do not murder. How do you do that with all your heart? You just do it, right? It's a behavioral thing. Or the same thing with not eating lobster. It's like, do not eat lobster with all your heart. No, you know, but the moral law reveals itself when it's like doing it with all your heart. That's important to understand that. Now, we're going to wait on this until next time to talk about anger. But the real thing I want you to see today is how Jesus, when he's talking about the law, gets us thinking about roots, about the roots of things. It's not just behavioral, visible stuff. It's about roots going down to the, the levels. And what he says here is fascinating. He says, you know, you, you've heard it said that if you murder, there's gonna, you're going to be judged for it. But I'm telling you, but I say to you that if you're angry, you'll be judged for it. If you call your brother Raka, which is a way of calling your brother a fool, something as minor as that, if you hold on to this kind of contempt and hatred in your heart, Jesus is saying, oh yeah, it's that serious. So I used to struggle with this passage. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not trying to be irreverent, but this is the truth. I used to hear this and say, so is it actually then okay? I mean, it like, are you saying if, if it's just as bad to be angry at someone to murder someone? I mean, if anger is murder, I might as well kill the guy, <laughs> right? Well, no, that's bad. It's actually worse to murder someone when you're angry, but Jesus is saying something deep here and wise. What he's saying is, no, it's the real root of it. That anger 
that you're nursing, that, that resentment that you're cultivating, that hatred, that this, <laughs> that thing that you're cultivating in your heart is actually qualitatively the same stuff. It's the same substance. It's the seedbed of murder. It's very important to think about this. I was thinking about this. It's kind of like what an unborn baby is compared to a baby. James speaks about this in James 1. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There's a picture here about sin being this kind of dynamic thing. Extreme sin, brothers and sisters, does not come from nowhere. It doesn't just erupt out of the blue. That's the lesson here. It comes from the soil that cultivates it. It comes from hearts that are indulging in this. Murder comes out of a heart that has been cultivating anger. Jesus is calling us, if you want to understand Christian ethics, in one big fell swoop. It has to do with the internal roots. It's looking down to the roots of things. And there's this phrase that I've shared before with you. I want to share it again now where it's, you know, you sow a thought. Sow a thought, as private as that, reap a habit. Sow a thought, reap an action, right? Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. That's pretty intense if you think about it. And if you think about a Christian life looks, I'm going to use this word that we've all been thinking a lot lately, epidemiologically. Right. We're all watching too much social media news, I suppose. And we're thinking about the coronavirus and we're learning all these things about the exponential character of epidemics. And in a funny way, I was thinking about this with with sin, Christian life. We we look at sin as almost an epidemic in this way. It's like a garden. You know, if you you're tending your garden and if you have that one weed there and you just ignore it, Two days later, it's going to be two weeds. And four days later, your whole garden is just destroyed and it's a mess. This is actually what we're talking about with sin. We underestimate it. We think, oh, it's just that one weed. It is not. It is a symptom of that looming disorder that is always there at work in our midst in a fallen world. Sin is this dynamic epidemiological thing that we are called to deal with. It is the fight of speaking order into disorder, light into darkness. And brothers and sisters, that's our purpose, is to shine light in the darkness. Now, I got to say, this is pretty intense when I think like this, when we really take seriously. What Jesus is saying here is that we'll be judged even for this kind of stuff, the intensity of it. And that's exactly right. That's kind of like the first use of the law is how we think about this. It's that the law exists to reveal the holiness of God, whose whole purpose is to drive us to Christ, to get us to see our need of him. What does it say in first John? Do you remember this? It basically has this great series of arguments. It says, listen, if you think you don't have sin, you are kidding yourself and the truth's not even in you. Right. And if you do sin, it's It's not okay, but you do have an advocate in heaven. Who? Jesus Christ, your advocate before the Father who will intercede with you. What should I do if I've sinned? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. And now what? Now he says, don't sin. Don't. How often in our lives are we satisfied with this kind of thing where we do, where we claim the name of Jesus Christ, where we talk about our faith and our lives are not changed? I got to say this. It is unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. Why do I say this? Because we're called for something else. Jesus calls his people disciples. We are called to be disciples. If you looked at that word before, you think about it. What does a disciple do? It's some who it's a person who lives a disciplined life. We are training in godliness, just like an athlete trains in in whatever sport they're doing. An athlete will train in running or throwing the javelin or what have you. We are training in godliness. And what does that mean? What does it look like? Well, let me give you just a couple of things. Humility. Where does humility come from? When, when we look at the greatness of God and in light of the greatness of God, realize the truth of the matter, which is our own wholly <laughs> undeserving of his love and grace. When we understand the greatness of God and our own undesert of grace, it makes us pretty humble. 
in the face of that. And an interesting thing that flows out of that, it's not degrading, it doesn't make us feel worse in a funny way, it liberates us so that we can be liberated of all this false pride and just stand there before God and say, you know, I'm coming to you, Lord, with nothing, and yet you love me anyway. I am nothing of myself. I am nothing but dust and ashes. But you have crowned me with glory and honor. You have made me your servant of the Most High. Oh, that's exciting. That's what it is. And it's out of love that we repent. If I can get you to hear one thing today, it's this is that repentance has so often gotten backwards. People hear this word, it's a religious sounding word, repent. It's kind of like someone standing on the subway, repent, stop doing what you're doing. You know, I, I don't want you to hear it that way. You know, this voice that comes along and I'm having fun and you know, someone's yelling at me to stop having fun. It's not that. Repentance flows from gratitude. Repentance flows from a heart that looks at God's greatness and with gratitude we say, you know what? You have changed my very desire. I want to be with you and I never want to be apart from you, God. And so my very desire is to turn to you. That's what repentance means. That's all. It means when I find myself in anything, anything that is going to separate me from you, I'm going to turn around and repent. I'm going to turn from that and turn back to you. That's what it takes. That's so exciting. The love of God changes us. Be quick to repent. That's what it is to be a Christian. What is true repentance? Right? It's not saying sorry to everybody. We think of that sometimes. You go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not repentance. That's some sort of wimpiness. What? It's not caving in. When, any, when anyone tells you you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and you have to cave in, and that's some sort No, it's not. Interestingly, you remember Job is, is suffering left and right, and his friends are all telling him, and it's on the base, there's quoting scripture at him. It's kind of, I'm telling you, Job, you did something wrong. No, I didn't, he says. Well, you have to, if right, you get into the... No, it's not saying sorry. It's not letting others walk over you. What is repentance? Repentance is this thing that's directed to God when our, we find our inner life, when that great light of the Spirit looks, we, we search ourselves and we find ourselves out of alignment with God's purposes. When we are doing things or thinking things, behaving in ways that separate us from God and we say, no, we are quick to turn from those paths which separate us to God. And that's what it means to be self-controlled. I want to summarize it this way. Why is this all so important? Because you have called, you've been called to be holy. Not just nice in your behavior. And, you know, it's not about looking within and finding your inner light. It's about looking to Christ, yielding, repenting, being transformed, and shining forth his glory. It is your calling as a holy priesthood to do this. Right? The power of repentance, this is the part I want to end on, is preceded by a decision. Whenever you hear decisions, you're thinking, what is that decision? You know, the decision for Christ I made 10 years ago? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a decision that you can make every morning, wherever you are, a decision that remembers who you are, a decision today, I'm going to live for Christ. And that's my call to you. Remember who you are. Don't be deluded. The world gets it wrong on both sides. You either come, we, we think too much of ourselves. We get all puffed up. I'm the king of the world. No, you're not. Leo. Right? <laughs> I'm the king of the world. I'm the best. Or, on the other hand, I am the worst. I'm, the, I'm, I'm just the lamest. Life isn't worth living. And neither of these things are wrong. I mean, neither of these things are right. You are Christ's. My favorite verse in scripture, 1 Corinthians 3.23, you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Amen. We're here on this planet for a few decades. Uh, I guess in Steve's prayer before, he was talking about the loss of uh, two of our congregants. And in, in the last two, we had a funeral yesterday and a passing today uh, because of uh, COVID-19 and it's heartbreaking and it's heavy. And at the same time, like it is with Christian Funerals, you know, we, we grieve the loss of friends. And at the same time, and I mean this, at the same time we rejoice at their being free now in the presence of God. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And the reason I bring this up is because 
there's this thing where it just reminds us of this great truth. We're only here for a few decades on this planet, for a few spins around the sun. This is our time to be here. Why are we here? Well, you're here to remember who you are, whose you are, and to live as God's servant. You are called to serve him. Remember who you are. Right? In seminary, it was interesting. My professor used to distinguish between what's the opposite of remember? You'll probably say, well, to forget. But in the context of a covenant, the opposite of remember is dismember, is to be cut off. And so it's the obligation of every generation to either remember ourselves back into covenant or to dismember, to cut ourselves off. So I'm going to end here almost. Just have two questions for you. All right. To live as a, as a Christian is a matter of making a decision, right? And the first one is this. Are you believing in Jesus today? Are you believing in Jesus today? Today, I'm going to call you. If you hear my voice, I, I ask you to do this. Are you, you know, are you hurting in the midst of these things? Then I want to, I want to call. And by the way, I'm not just talking to the non-believer. I'm not just talking to you who is listening to this and is uh, wants to become a believer, but doesn't know how I'm talking also to you who have confessed Christ for a long time and, and are just feeling lost, confused. I want you to look to Christ and I want you to trust in God's promises. And pray, Father, I believe your promises and I will trust in Christ and I will conform my life. I will follow you with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. I will be a disciple. And you're thinking, some of you, well, my faith is imperfect. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've been a Christian 20 some odd years and I'm still, I don't know. My faith is so weak sometimes. It's like, yeah, but you're not saved by the, your faith, by the strength of your faith, are you? It's like by a whole bunch of striving that turns it into a work again. How strong is my faith? It's not about your faith. It's not about how strong your feelings are, how consistent your emotions are. It's about the power of God and Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Are you ready? In one word, rest. Rest in the truth of the gospel that he did it. Rest. That's the message of the gospel. People, it's so simple. People almost like can't believe it when you say it sometimes. But the gospel is this. Jesus has done it for you. Now, God is calling you to rest in that. Rest in the assurance that you are loved by God. And now in this dignity, I'm lifting you up from the dirt and filth of the world. And I'm adorning you in clothes of righteousness. And I'm calling you. I'm setting you apart as my servant. You know how it says in Ephesians 6, I want you to be armed in all the armor of God to go out in that? Well, of course, it's, it's uh, St. Patrick's season. And I'm going to read St. Patrick's breastplate, best prayer ever. St. Patrick writes, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, the firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptations of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill afar and near. Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength. Amen. Woo! That'll wake you up in the morning. Why did he write that? You ever think about this? It's not just a whole bunch of fine words. 
Patrick wrote that because he was in the midst of a culture which was literally out to kill him. <laughs> From every side, he was facing opposition to the gospel, and he would arm himself. He would call on all the forces of nature under God's dominion, and he would say, in Christ, I am set apart. I am a consecrated servant of God, and that is what I'm calling us to. In the midst of all of this fear out there, we are the servants of God. We are loved and accepted in God's sight. We are children of the Most High and servants of the King. There's the holy war. The holy war is within. The holy war looks at sin and says, sin will have no dominion in this heart. <sighs> Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that we can open your scripture and hear the words of our Savior spoken. We thank you, Lord, for the extraordinary gift of your calling to us. Were it not enough that we should be saved out of our condition of sin and misery, that you would reveal yourself to us through Jesus, that we would be able to look at Jesus and see your very love for us in a person. But Lord, how much, even more, how much on top of that, that you then set us aside, set us apart, anoint us and consecrate us as your servants to be a holy priesthood, a holy nation. Lord, we pray that we would honor you in our life, that amidst fearful times, you would give us great courage and encouragement, that you would help us to bring encouragement to others as you have given us rest, as we look to you, oh Lord, give us the wisdom to rest the central message of the gospel. Jesus has done it. Give us the wisdom to rest. And now in that rest and in that comfort, help us to bring rest and comfort to others. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
So brothers and sisters, as we're stuck at home in various ways, and as our society has all sorts of fears, I ask you to rest in the completed work of Christ and to rejoice in what he's done for you and to remember what you've been called to be. You are priests of the Almighty, servants of the King. And then to repent, to turn anything from anything that keeps you from communion with the Lord. That's our commission this week. Let us live for the Lord. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift his face to thee and give thee peace. Amen. <laughs>